parable of the Good Samaritan is a very familiar parable, virtually universal. My simple prayer as I begin this sermon is that each one of us will gain insight from looking at this parable once again. Furthermore, let each one of us have a renewed commitment to live out the direct teaching of this parable. Indeed, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, O God. Amen. Amen. I'm going to be talking through the reading of this parable so that as I read the portion, I'm going to explain um, and stop during the reading to give some of the background. And then after I've read through it, then I will be really focusing on the direct application of, this, of the lesson that Jesus intends with the teaching of this parable. First of all, by way of context, Jesus is an itinerant rabbi. He's recognized by many as being a teacher and cited popular response. He teaches with authority. So there were those who heard teach, teachings from Jesus and it resounded in them and they said, yes, this man knows what he's talking about. He's sent from God. And then there were others, especially other experts, other teachers, that were perhaps suspicious or challenging of Jesus. But one of the basic dynamics of learning within the Jewish community, especially during the time of Jesus, was question and answer. And so this context that Jesus is out and he's talking and it's a public setting and that an expert in the law approaches him with a question is very normal. This is a normal exchange. And so with that as context, we read the following. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit, inherit, <laughs> inherit eternal life? He's asking a direct question to Jesus the rabbi, known as an expert in the law. Question is answered with a question. A normal exchange during that time. It wasn't being disrespectful. It was a normal exchange. So Jesus replied, what is written in the law? I know. After all, you're an expert in the law. You tell me what's written there. How do you read it? The expert answers, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. Notice how comprehensive it is, this love of God. See, even to this day, if we say, I love you, that's wonderful. I love you because I appreciate this quality in you. That's getting more specific, isn't it? And there's a deeper level of communication when that happens. So the law is simple, love God. But the law goes deeper. Heart, mind, soul, physical strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Again, it's been noted often that we are called to love ourselves, to be kind to ourselves, at times to forgive ourselves. To love ourselves is empowering so that in turn we can love others, our neighbors, and we can love God. Jesus responds to the expert, you have answered correctly. Aces, well done. Now, what's a little ironic about this, it's noted the expert in the law, and he gave an answer that pretty much any Jew at that time might have been able to answer, most likely would have. It was that common, it was that broadly accepted. It was the plain teaching of Scripture. So Jesus replied, you have answered correctly. Do this and live. See, again, we're reminded the purpose of the law was not to be a burden, but the purpose of the law revealed to the people of Israel was to uniquely call them and to say that when you follow the law, 
that this fills you with purpose, with focus, and it fulfills your life. The law is there to give life, not to rob or drain you of life. So Jesus said, do this and you'll live. Again, very fundamental understanding of the purpose and the exchange up to this point. The conversation could have easily ended there. But it says in the passage, he wanted, he, the expert in the law, wanted to justify himself. Perhaps he was thinking, righteousness through deeds. After all, I'm an expert in the law. I've committed my life to studying the law. So, yes, I want to make sure that I'm going to be right and I will inherit the kingdom. And so he asked another question. Maybe he was thinking, oh, I opened up and I asked a question, and then I got a question back. And I could show my knowledge. Well, I'll ask another question, and Jesus will ask me a question back, and I can continue to reveal my knowledge. It's hypothetical. That's just Gary's act of imagination, as we try to see it from a human point of view. So he asked another question. Okay, love the God, Lord your God with all the stipulations. Love your neighbor as yourself. Good question. Who is my neighbor? Well, Jesus didn't ask another question back. What did he do? His favorite teaching method, a parable. Just to remind us that a parable, unlike an allegory, allegorical teaching, a parable generally has one primary point. It's a fictitious story drawing on everyday experiences so that people listening get it right away, they understand it's plain language, to teach a spiritual lesson. And most often, parables have one spiritual lesson. Who is my neighbor? Listen to a story. <coughs> a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Jericho. By the way, that journey was the commonly understood nickname, the way of blood. It was a treacherous journey, a dangerous journey. Traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho, when he was attacked by robbers, they stripped him of his clothes, beat him, went away, leaving him half dead. Pretty graphic, vulnerable. A priest, who is a priest? What is a priest? A priest is from the tribe of Levi, and that the role of being a priest is passed from generation to generation, and they are in charge of the ceremonial and the sacrifice of bringing the sacrifice that the humans bring, the members of Israel, to offer before God. So they stand between God and man, not only ceremonially, but also as mediators. Member of the tribe, the Levites, passed on from generation to generation, very central to the very essence of what it means to be religious and to practice your religion in Judaism at that time. A priest came along of the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. He didn't just walk by, he averted the situation as far as he could. And so to a Levite, same tribe, but not of the priestly line, so that Levites were there to support the priests and to support the ongoing temple and synagogue worship and gathering and sacrifices of the time. So again, inherited and very important to keep the whole system going. Both the priest and the Levite are formally trained religious leaders within the nation of Israel. And to a Levite, when he came on the place and saw the man, he passed by on the other side of the road. But, a Samaritan. And again, many of us know this, but we're reminded that the Israelites of ancient Samaria 
who were not deported when the Assyrians conquered Israel in 722 before Common Era. They had stayed behind. Assyria conquered Israel. They took off most of the prominent leaders from all the tribes, but in the tribe, the Samaritan tribe, there was a significant portion of people that were just left there. Over 700 years before the time of Jesus. Over that period of time, they developed their own religious traditions. They intermarried with non-Jews. So as the Jews came back from being taken to Assyria and began to reclaim their land, reestablish their traditions, there was a division. And they truly hated the Samaritans. The Samaritans were a diminishing population, but make it very clear, they hated the Samaritans. Now we know Jesus did not, for other reasons, not part of the scope of this sermon, but we know Jesus did not hate the Samaritans. But what do we have? Two professional religious people that were to represent God and to were to serve not only in the temple, but serve the people in these unique roles in the very heart of the practice of Judaism, and then a Samaritan who was hated that was outside the boundaries of proper Israelites, even though they had the same long-term heritage. Division. As much as human behavior changes, or as much as things change, do human behavior change. And we know that it's so easy to find divisions within our families, within our communities, within our nation and world. Where we look to the other as being something not like us. So the Samaritan, he traveled and came where the man was. And when the Samaritan saw him, he took pity on him. He went up to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denarii, that is two full day wages, an entire day's wage, and gave them to the innkeeper with this statement, look after him, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any other extra expenses you have. The parable is done. What's the one lesson? It started with the question, who is my neighbor? Jesus picks up on that same thing when now he asks the expert in the law, interpret the parable. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor? The expert responded, the one who had mercy on him. Who is my neighbor? The one who showed mercy. Jesus said, go and do likewise. What is the one lesson from the parable of the Good Samaritan? To show mercy. To be a loving neighbor. But notice, it's the word and the deed. It's both coupled together. To hear the message. We want to learn how to love God with all our mind, heart, and soul. And how do we do that? We love our neighbor. We love our neighbors ourselves. And how do we love our neighbor? We show mercy. We hear the word. We're committed because we say we want to love God. And then we do and demonstrate our love for God by loving our neighbor. That's it. So the rest is some application through my reflection. Word and deed. And yet, this word and deed concept was common to other teachings of Jesus. This is not the only reference that Jesus has to this pattern. I'm going to cite just a couple. In Matthew 25, 
another parable, there were those who were brought before the king, and they were judged. And to one group, the king said, when I was hungry, you fed me. When I was naked, you clothed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me water. And the people responded and said, well, when did we do that? And the king responded, I tell you the truth, whatever you did, word and deed, this is the deed, whatever you did to the least of these brothers, to the least of these sisters, to the least of these peace people, those who were the other, those who were vulnerable, who were weak, who had a need to be supported, whatever you did to the least of these people, you did for me. Well done, my good and faithful servant. And they received the reward. So in this parable, it's very clear that there are those who are doing the will of God, not consciously, but out of a conviction within that this is the right way to live. And they are doing by loving their neighbor. And there's also the warning. There are the other group of people that came and says, depart from me. Well, why? Because when I was hungry, when I was naked, when I was thirsty, you did not do anything. Well, when did we see you hungry, naked, and thirsty? Whatever you do to others passing by, you did also to me. <clears throat> Matthew 7. Not everybody who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. A direct quote now, I'm reading directly from Scripture. Many will say to me on that day, the day when we are face to face and have accountability, many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, we did, we did not prophesy in your name, and in your name did not, I'm sorry, I read it wrong, let me go back. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and in your name perform many miracles. Didn't, didn't this happen, God? Lord, didn't this happen? Then I, God, will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Depart from me. Go away from me, evil doers. And again, the challenge to know God the core teaching is to love God, all our heart, mind, and soul, and based on our love for God, is not only to be able to love ourselves, but then to do what? To love our neighbors. And that there are those who appear to do great things in the name of God, but God is looking and saying, wait a second, the word is not hidden in your heart. You really weren't doing it to know me to proclaim the lessons and the way that I would treat people. You are doing it for your own purposes. And then the last passage. Jesus is teaching. The context, he's in a house and it's packed with people. And, and, and at one point in time as he's teaching, the word is passed to Jesus, one to the next. They say, Jesus, your mother and brothers have arrived. And everybody thinks, okay, Jesus is going to stop everything. Okay, let's take a break, take five, and go out and immediately greet his mother and his brothers. Instead, a teachable moment. What did Jesus do? Who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And of course, they've just arrived. They're outside. You know, the literal mother and father are out there. But the moment that Jesus grasped was pointing to his disciples as one who said, come follow me, and they said yes, and left everything to follow him, to be their disciples, to be a follower of Jesus, to learn the lessons from Jesus, to live as Jesus taught, to be obedient. Pointing to his disciples, he said, here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother, sister, and mother. Obedience. Jesus is teaching very directly. Hear my word. Hear the lesson that I am offering. And then live differently because you are wanting to love God and love your neighbor from the core.
core of your being. Obedience. Disciples are followers of Jesus Christ. Disciples learn and live out Jesus' teachings. It's the word that we internalize, and it's the deeds by how we live that we are called to do God's will. Whoever does the will of the Father is my sister, my brother, my mother. Through obedience, we demonstrate that we are truly a family of God. What is God's will? Very straightforward. Love God. Love your neighbor. Who is my neighbor? The one who you show mercy. Go and do likewise. How do we show mercy? Number one, we have to be open and committed to be merciful and to actually act on that teaching. The Samaritan was committed. As he saw a person in need, he stopped. Not only that, the Samaritan was equipped. He had knowledge of first aid. He had oil, he had wine, he had bandages. Furthermore, he had a donkey so that he could pick the man up, put him on the donkey, and then take him to an inn and give instructions, say, continue to do this. And not only that, he had the resources to say, not only will I take care of him, but when I leave, innkeeper, please continue the care. And here's the resources you need to do that. When we're called to love our neighbor, we also are mindful that God uniquely equips us to demonstrate love, and that we are not all equipped with the same gifts. Here's a modern day illustration, here's a modern day story. May I be so bold as to say it's a modern day parable. A man is working an overnight shift, and he's driving home and he's tired, he's worked all night. And he approaches and he sees a car pulled over by the side of the road with a flat tire. So he stops. And it turns out it's a woman and she's not able to change the tire. And so he willingly puts aside his desire to go home and get to bed. And he stops and he helps the woman. And then she offered him payment. And he refused to take money. He just wanted to be merciful. The rescued woman then proceeds on her journey, and she ends up stopping at a small cafe for breakfast. And she's served by a kind wait waitress who is obviously pregnant and obviously tired. The woman who was rescued left a $100 tip. The waitress then went home. And as she came home from her day shift, her husband is waking up, and she shared her good fortune. And he realized the woman who left the tip was the same woman that he had changed the tire for. A real story? No, it's made up. A real modern parable? Perhaps. What's the point? As equipped. The woman was not equipped to change her own tire, but the man was willing to do it. The woman accept the kindness of being served a meal by a waitress who was tired. And she realized, but I am equipped to use a phrase that we hear to pay it forward. I was just given mercy. I will now demonstrate some mercy and to love to this woman, to encourage her. So she was equipped to leave a sizable tip. As uniquely equipped, the principle is mercy is not necessarily a call to do something that we're not equipped to do. But mercy is to first be open to look for opportunities to be kind. And then to, as guided by the Spirit, to uniquely offer support as we are equipped to do. In the midst of illness, it's sometimes difficult to go visit people who are ill. It's easier to go on the other side. 
when we go and visit somebody who's ill, we're not responsible to heal them. But perhaps we are called and we are equipped to be present, to demonstrate love, and to sit with them. People are going through grief. We can't take away people's grief. But we can sit and we can listen as they give sorrow words, seeking for God's healing in the midst of the pain that they're going through. Every act of mercy and kindness is fulfilling the teaching of this parable. And I believe that the simple point of the parable is, as God's children, as members of the family, we have heard the lesson and we want to do God's will and ultimately the way we demonstrate loving God, yes, through worship, yes, through prayer, yes, through expressing gratitude and thanksgiving, but ultimately the best and strongest way we demonstrate we love God is to look for opportunities to love our neighbor as we are uniquely equipped to do. What's true for who we are God didn't ask anybody, doesn't ask anybody to do something that we're not equipped to do. I'm going to get closer to home now and be very direct. The American Baptist Churches USA, as a national movement, invite people to participate in annual special offerings, over and above offerings. The point is, it's an opportunity to give over and above what we normally give to the church, what we call tithes and offerings, to special projects. This March, we invited people to give to One Great Art Sharing, which is our international and national relief branch of our denomination, and we invited people to give to Ukraine. We had a generous response. We're not equipped to go and help in, in Ukraine, are we? But we want to treat the Ukrainians as our neighbor. And we're not supporting the military war effort. That's a government choice. But we're saying these are people that are hurting. We have pity. We want to be merciful. And so we choose to give a gift representing that. And our church was generous. About the same time, and this may be why it overshadowed, the Ukrainian appeal overshadowed America for Christ offering, which is again an annual offering. For those of you who are part of our church, this is not new. It was asked for at about the same time. And this supports those people that within our denomination have had a calling to do missionary work within the nation of Israel, uh, I'm sorry, the nation of the U.S. It's America for Christ. Those people who serve locally in various settings, they have responded to the call. They are dependent on financial support so that in turn they can support their families. And so we have this opportunity to give a gift. This year, again, very likely overshadowed by Ukraine and the overwhelming need there, we only had five individuals give to that offering. The rest of us pass by. Now, I don't know who gave, and I don't know how much, other than the gift that Deb and I gave. But the point is to think about this. We're not called to be, all called to be missionaries. But when an appeal